Okay, well thanks everyone for coming along. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, all good. Okay, so look, um, this one was done on the plane on the way here. So uh, we'll just wing it. Uh, I've got about 20 slides, so hopefully we'll get through that in about 20 minutes, 20 minutes to half an hour. So plenty of time for you to throw anything at me with questions. But this is what I thought uh, we might cover because really this is what I've been, I've been in the job uh, for a, not quite, uh, actually sorry, just over 11 months. I think I've got about three weeks to go for my, complete my first year. So it's really um, been driving uh, a lot of change and really been focusing on, on that change process over the last 12 months. And uh, I guess I want to uh, let you know where, where we've got to with that. So firstly, the focus being on the new GRDC. I said to staff after we did a, I guess, a, a final, uh, you know, one of those terrible people restructure things, we hit the but button on the, on the final phase of it uh, about two weeks ago. And as I said to staff about a week ago, today is day one in the new GRDC. So it's about rebuilding from here. So what I want to do is cover over what, what we've actually, what, what we've been changing, what those drivers of change have been. Um, part of that has been some clarity of purpose, which uh, I'll explain uh, that as well, what that means. Also, um, I guess there was, uh, different attitudes both within the research partner community but very much within GRDC on their attitude towards commercialisation and IP and we certainly get that sort of feedback from our research partners as well. So I want to give you a summary of where, that go, where, where, where we've got to and what it might mean to you. And then finally we've just started the next uh, five year uh, strategic R&D plan and I hope to give you a bit of an insight into where uh, I think it's going to go in, the, in light of a changing um, repositioning Australian grains industry or rapidly repositioning Australian grains industry. Okay. So, drivers for change. Well, this, all of this uh, won't be very uh, new news to you, changing technologies, markets, climates, consolidation from one end of the grains industry to the other, from farm, farm size all the way through to multinational life science company consolidation going on at the moment with Dow Pioneer, Monsanto uh, and Bayer for example as well. Over the last five years GRDC has moved, uh, for various reasons, has moved from being about a 35 per cent of or contributing 35 per cent of the total dollar investment in grains R&D to 60 per cent and that's largely driven by I guess an increase in revenue over time from GRDC. Uh, there are various factors that have contributed to that and also a decline in investment particularly in well some sectors of the university uh, environment but less so in the university and much more in the state government uh, investment in grains R&D has declined rapidly. The, the department in Western Australia for example has recently moved from about 1500 uh, employees to 900 employees working on R&D that is. So for us from GRDC's perspective uh, we're often reminded uh, that there's never been a greater onus on us being delivering value to growers and, uh, and I think some of the change process that, that started uh, more than a year before or let's say up to a year before I started was driven by a uh, grower recognising that they are paying, we, we, some corporates, some consolidated farms are paying in the order of six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a year in levies, and they're asking the question, "What's my return on investment?" And they're challenging that levy investment. And our organisation has responded to that. Have we responded smartly to it? 
we can debate that one in a minute. Okay, um, I had a pretty unique opportunity when I first started uh, with GRDC. I knew that I was going to be the new managing director. The board knew I was going to be the new managing director for about four months before it was announced. Nobody else did. Um, that gave me, given I was working intimately in the grains industry, in my role with AGT and a lot of other industry roles that I, that I sit in, a great opportunity to sit and listen to what people had to say about GRDC, uh, honestly, uh, and straight barrels. And I could ask questions uh, without people holding back. So some of the messages that I got were, well actually this one wasn't a message. This one I got from interviewing directors before I started uh, and inter interviewing senior staff, executives in the organisation. It became very clear to me one of the serious issues in this organisation was they didn't know their why. The why GRDC existed. There was confusion, difference of opinion about who the primary beneficiary was for a start. So, you know, some people weren't even prepared to say, oh, I would have thought most of you would sit there and go, it's clear, GRDC, your primary beneficiary is levy payers, right? Growers. Well, that wasn't so obvious to board members and some of the executives. They'd say, you can't single out one, you've got to include government in there. But if you're true to a purpose, you have one beneficiary, one primary beneficiary. So uh, this, not only not understanding who your primary beneficiary was, but understanding what your whole purpose about being was there, really affected culture, attitudes, and affected confusion in our investment strategy. So clarity of purpose was one of the first things, in fact, started working on it two weeks before I got there, first board meeting, spent the whole board meeting talking about purpose. Um, this was the feedback we got from everybody else. Um, you, you have an inflexible and unresponsive investment process. You're a draconian and hierarchical in the way you manage partnerships and relationships. You have a lack of transparency in uh, your investment decision making. It's not really clear about what it, why you're investing in this area and why you're not investing in this area. We had a perception, and I might say it's a reality, a perception of being bureaucratic and very slow and unresponsive. So people would ring. We had a situation where I was told that the chair of Grain Producers Australia, Andrew Wiedemann, rang a senior executive in GRDC and didn't get a reply for two months. And he rang two or three times in that period. That's not good enough. Also, and we would have, also we have a perception of being not very good to do business with. I uh, recently gave a similar talk to this one at a group of the national rd and &E strategy where there was uh, uh, senior executives from universities and state government departments and I said we aren't good to do business with and every head in the room nodded. So, hmm, not so good. Right, so they were the drivers, they were the the motivation for us to, um, to change the way GRDC behaved, the way that GRDC approaches, the way that GRDC is structured, the way we questioned and reassessed our values, looked hard at our systems and processes, and we're also starting a new five-year strategic plan. Not all of this started when I started. Some of it started before I was. I am part of the change process. I was brought in as part of that change process. So, I mentioned about the clarity of purpose, and this was what we came up with with a half day board workshop and with executive in it. And that is the why for GRDC is that we invest in research, development, and, and extension to create enduring profitability for Australian grain growers. Now, that sounds all a bit trite, right? 
Well, every word in there means something. Um, it's no accident that it's in there. The word invest is um, a clear change of mindset and culture in the organisation. It is about a return on investment to levy powers. Those levy powers are asking big questions and we need to deliver to them a return on investment. I see ourselves as much a super, super fund man manager as anything else. I want to be in a situation where if, if, it, if there wasn't legislation that, were, that forced growers to pay a levy that they would choose to pay a GRDC levy. Not a sugar levy though, Neil. But. Um, so investment culture. RDNE, well that's the constraints that we operate within the PERD Act. Create. Create is about innovation. We've, we over, I guess in response to that levy payers questioning uh, their return on investment, we have tended to shift our portfolio towards being seen to be doing research as opposed to actually doing research or seen to be investing in research. So we wanted to have lots and lots of plots in lots and lots of places so everybody could see where their dollar investment was and less focus on actually delivering something. So it's about creating, it's about innovating, it's about being transformational going forward. And we'll come back to that in a minute. The key word in here is profitability. Profitability. The, the organisation very, very much was focused on productivity. And there's some reasons for that and I'll come to that in a minute. The other one is Australian grain growers. Okay, no one else. The argument here is, yes, government contributes about, federal government contributes about 30% of the uh, total revenue to the organisation. However, we went to Barnaby and we went to Ann Ruston and we went to Joel Fitzgibbons and we went to Barry O'Sullivan and all the senators that sit on the Senate Estimates Committee for Agriculture and fry me three times a year, went to them and said, unashamedly, we're going to be about profitability for growers. Are you okay with that? And we said, we're unashamedly going to be about profitability for growers because a healthy grower, means a healthy grains industry. A healthy grains industry is somebody that's contributing very on a large scale to a healthy economy. They went, great, get on with it. Don't come back unless you've got a problem. Then you better <laughs> come back in a hurry. Um, profitability, right. Profit equals yield times price minus cost. Now, the organisation had focused very, very much on productivity. There was a view, a very strong view, held at the very hierarchy, of the, at the very top of the organisation, that any investment post-farm gate was not captured by growers. There was no benefit captured by growers, therefore we'll focus on on-farm productivity investments. And I, I know for a fact there are people in this room that are, are, are working in quality area and I'm sure your funding has probably become less and less over the last four or five years. My argument back to uh, these people on our board, or one in particular, is I just put this simple equation there. It said I could take 80% of a million dollars or I could take 8% of a billion dollars, I know which one I'd have, the one with a lot more zeros. And so looking at, at productivity and just arguing that, that uh, Australian grain growers might in that situation only capture 8% uh, of the total benefit, hell, it's about how much money ends up in the pocket at the end of the day. Right. Um, I guess this wasn't intended. When we went through the purpose, uh, a clarification of purpose, that's when we realised that the views of what the commercial approach and IP management attitudes of the organisation uh, were from here to there, from uh, benevolent society to a uh, cooperative, full-on company, R&D investment company, seriously, from that end to that end within one board. 
that's what their views were when you interviewed them separately. So we went through a prep, went through the process, and so any wonder that you and anybody outside was confused about GRDC's attitude to IP when there was that much confusion internally. So we went through a process to essentially define what we meant by it, and there's two parts to that definition. One is about mindset, behaviour and culture, and that's about that word invest that's in that purpose. That's pretty simple. It's an investment return. We are in the process of banning the word fund from the vocabulary of GRDC people, and uh, we hope that we've already banned the word grant, or grant, however you say it up here. Mindset and behaviours. But where we got to with this was GRD's intent in its commercialisation and IP management strategy is to ensure that levy payers can optimise the value captured on their R&D investment. Or if you take the flip side of that, can minimise the value lost to third parties who don't contribute. A really good example of this is our recent uh, very large scale investment with uh, Bayer on uh, new herbicide products. It's uh, $45 million over five years. And the arrangement there from an IP point of view is they will invest, uh, we will invest on screening all of their new products on Australian weeds. That's what we're paying for. But if they identify a compound that works in the US, works in Europe, then GRDC gets a cut of the revenue of that. That comes back and is reinvested in, in prof, profit driving R&D for, um, for Australian levy pays. So it's a fairly simple model if you think it in that context. Uh, um, it's, it's actually really easy to make a decision about what your strategy is in commercialisation. There isn't a one all fit, fits all though. If you think about it in that context, there isn't a formula that fits everything. You have to think about it as a philosophy and then design a strategy appropriately for every project, program or initiative. Right, so probably the bit that we've been focusing on in the last little while is major structural changes. There are all those issues that I said were drivers, they were all linked starting first and foremost with a lack of clarity of purpose, but then there were a whole heap of other things, silos and all sorts of collections and things that were, were not quite right. So I'll just give you a breakdown and summary of, of what we've changed. We had a, a large corporate communications division. Um, now there's two people, there was something like 12 uh, a few, couple of those people have moved off into a grower's communication, but this was about us promoting ourselves. Our view was to buy in engagement from the federal government, we needed to promote ourselves. We needed to brand awareness. We needed to be out there with GRDC, GRDC, GRDC. It needed to be on Pitt Street or on, or on uh, what's, your, what's your main street here? I forgot, but um, George Street, that's it. Yeah. Um, and we needed people talking about it. No, we just want levy payers going to government and saying, we think we get a really good uh, investment. This is valuable for the grains industry. This is essential for the grains industry. We have levy payers saying it, not us. So refocus on growers. We had a, one of those classic bureaucracies you have in a government where you have a corporate services branch where they become their islander, they become a, the monster of themselves. <laughs> um, and that's essentially what was going on in our business group. So we merged and took bits and pieces out and realigned the functions of IT and finance and business development and the commercialisation functions and economics, brought it all into one one area uh, aligned, but then have worked really hard at trying to get them integrated within the rest in cross-functional teams, which I'll come back to in a minute. We've, most 90% of the research was all embedded within one, basically, uh, business group under one manager. So we've split that and created a new one with a lot of big holes for growth. And a lot of big holes I'll come to in a minute. The common link 
in amongst the things that we've put in this group is data. We'll come back to that. Um, again, a, a refocusing on um, our contact with growers and moving away, and I'll come back to this one, uh, uh, but it's about active project management and cross-functional cross teams to design projects for optimum strategy and optimum delivery pathways. We definitely had moved away from that. We now have, uh, will have dedicated extension people, extension managers, not extension doers, extension facilitators and grower relation people, two per region. In the north we'll have one in Toowoomba and one in Wagga. In, in the south we'll have one in Adelaide and one in, somewhere in regional Victoria. In WA we'll have two in Perth because uh, logistics. We're going to bring MVT in-house and I'll explain uh, that, but it's essentially about capturing gr much greater value. GRD, uh, MVT is pretty close to, from a multiple crop testing, variety testing uh, network, it's as big and more comprehensive as any in the world from a multiple crop testing uh, capacity and it's grossly underutilised in terms of value capture opportunity out of it. For growers I meant. We, we moved, you may remember, we moved to a regional uh, hub and spoke model with the creation of offices in Adelaide, Perth and Toowoomba and a small one in Dubbo. They didn't work. They worked to some extent, but they didn't work in others. We got really good, much better buy-in from growers, uh, some better relationships with research managers depending on people, but uh, it wasn't structured really right. The real reason was we didn't put one person accountable, one person who was the culture driver, one person who could be the primary point of contact for people in that area, research partners, growers, uh, industry. So we didn't structure it quite right. I talked about active management of projects. Um, what, we've, what we were doing was, for some reason or other, we were driven by cost. When, you, when somebody said to me one day, they said, if you can't manage, you can't measure outcomes or outputs, you will focus on cost. And so this organisation, if you read the 2014-15 annual report, line five of the chairman's and CEO's report says proudly, we only expend 4.9% of our, of our uh, revenue on overheads in this organisation. And that's about, I think the average is about 15 or something, Neil, and, and, and the highest is probably in the order of 30. We were proud of that. I took that into our board meeting and said, you should be ashamed of this. You should be ashamed of it. Because you are under-investing in your core business, over-investing in publicising yourself, and grossly under underestimate and not being able to deliver on outcomes because you are driven by cost and not by outcomes. And so we had people, research managers, running at 1,000 miles an hour not doing anything properly on a treadmill going crazy. Like we have people managing over 150 projects. Now if you do a work up on managing, actively managing 150 projects, you're working up another 150 pro new projects of, uh, pretty much every probably second or third year, and then you, you're doing all the reporting on the end, you work it out, you can spend probably a half a day a project. So are you, as a manager in GRDC, are you managing effectively the, that portfolio if you're managing 150 projects? Don't think so. But we had, I would imagine there's five or six people in GRDC managing well over 100 projects each. Crazy. So the aim now is to skill the t team up, resource the organisation up, invest in people and manage with a research manager managing between 20 and 30 projects each, or programs each. And when I say manage, I mean actively manage in a cross-functional team. So another reason why we've part of the restructural redesign, cross-functional teams within regions. So a cross-functional team, let's imagine it's a, 
uh, a soils project or something like that. It'll be led by our soils research manager. It would have an extension manager as part of that cross-functional team. It would have a business development manager as part of that cross for its part of their time. It would have some corporate, um, sorry, council, legal council as part of that. It may have a panel member or two in it, and then that team would work actively with and partner with the research, partner with the research agencies to actively manage those projects. And what we mean by actively is design them and to start working on the next one while you're already starting on the first one. So to get that continuity, you don't need bilaterals and things like that if you're actively managing relationships and strategies. Um, designing projects, programs and initiatives, monitoring them and jointly agreeing on fast track strategies, shutdown strategies, redirection strategies to ensure good return on investment on the dollars. That doesn't mean draconian milestone management, which is what we, that's how we thought we needed to manage projects in the past. It's about relationships going forward. It's all about return uh, on investment to growers. Some of you would know about the, for those that uh, do get, uh, or we're getting, or have been getting GRDC funding, uh, about, I think nearly two years ago, I'm not quite sure, for various reasons, a little bit about that delivery to growers and being seen to be, we changed, for, and there are other drivers, we changed to a time to delivery model. We said to research partners, you're a researcher, you do research, don't do extension, we'll get somebody else to do extension, take that and put it over here. Um, I, when I came in, and I, I guess I started in, well, I started in plant breeding, went on to ag agronomy management for a few years, and then back to plant breeding in my career. But while I was managing an agronomy team, if somebody said to me, you, can't, you won't do extension, I would have said, you can stick your job. I said, I don't, don't want to be part of it. Because that, con that continuum, and delivery, and that feedback mechanism was critical to it. Uh, and I just, there were a whole heap of other issues why that, uh, that model doesn't work. So that model has been finished and it'll be replaced by actively managed cross-functional teams. Um, for various reasons, huge silos between staff and panel system and we're in the process of rebuilding that whole um, uh, relationship and reconfiguring it. Um, and involving panels at a different level uh, in a going forward. So you'll see quite a change in dynamic. Uh, you may already already started to see those that interact with panels may see a change in the dynamic that it's evolving out of it. Much more of a partnership uh, approach, um, one GRDC approach. We're definitely a hierarchical bureaucratic organisation. So. Um, this, is, this is about, well you would know about that responsiveness and if you had any idea about what it takes to get approval process for even a simple $10,000 or $20,000 variation on a project, get it through the system, it's just uh, incredible bureaucracy that's, that's in there that we're um, in the process of, uh, of, uh, of changing. Right, that's it for uh, the summary of it, this is how it actually looks. So these big, these, these are the business groups. So business and commercial has all of the finance and IT business development groups. So uh, Ron Osmond and uh, Dion and co. We will be putting a business development manager in the office at Toowoomba and one in Adelaide and one in uh, Perth as well, in addition. Uh, this is a consolidation of all of the extension and comms activity uh, for growers into one group. And uh, we recently appointed as the executive manager of this group, uh, Kevin Norman out of the University of Southern Queensland. Um, and this is the applied research and development group and what we're calling at the moment, until we get our new executive in, it's called enabling platforms, but it'll probably end up being called something else.
because they will have the right to call their team whatever they want to be called. Uh, this one has been agreed recently by this team. So I'll, I'll explain these, uh, these two groups here, what they look like, because these are the ones that you mostly will interact with. Right, so the Applied Research and Development uh, Program uh, research area basically is about crop protection, agronomy, farming systems, soils and nutrition. And I guess the take home message is there'll be more managers, under here is two or three contract administrators and the like, but more managers, one dedicated to soils and nutrition in each region, sorry where's north, here we are, one dedicated to soils and nutrition in the north, one dedicated to agronomy and farming systems in the north, and also a crop protection manager dedicated in the north. So they're the people that you will interface with and we have these senior regional managers which will take a higher role and higher uh, uh, influence role. They'll sit on, uh, on part of the executive of the organisation and will be the primary point contact uh, for uh, most, of course, you know, in areas relating to, say, genetic technologies or the like, or other areas, there are other people, but these will be the facilitators and primary network point, points uh, for the organisation in the north, south and west. So that's that group. I'm not going to really uh, say too much because that's the group that's probably changed the least. Um, what I want to do, and I know there are quite a few people involved in uh, pre-breeding research and activity, I want to give you a bit more insight into the new look uh, group that in has pre-breeding in it. Okay, if we look at our, where we've come from and where we are right here and today, a snapshot in time right now, we invest in tools and technologies, phenotyping, sources of genetic diversity, markers for traits of interest, um, basically marker-assisted selection tools for breeding programs, QTL mapping, um, and provide donor material with that QTL mapping amongst uh, uh, other activities. But that's the primary focus of our, of our uh, uh, investment in pre-breeding. I guess the downside of that, the limitations of that, is uh, that the mapping is involving research populations, uh, the difficulty for breeders to be deploying mul multiple QTLs of small effect, um, and it really ultimately results in largely being adopted in the form of, of markers that are focused on genetically simple high value traits. So going forward, advanced breeding programs uh, that are sort of cutting edge these days and there is a very big diversity in where people are at from from way down here to way up there, global uh, for cereals or whatever, right up there. Um, and they're more about wanting to integrate empirical selection into, into genomic selection methodologies and combining those. And that changes the whole paradigm of how we think about uh, pre-breeding investment, moving away from things like QTL mapping, which in future is embedded entirely within commercial breeding programs. So pre-breeding in GRDC needs to transition to an enabling function rather than a standalone activity. So pretty to describe where the, the, the we, we'll, we'll be looking essentially at this very simplified uh, equation I suppose about rates of genetic gain, uh, we'll be using this very simplified to essentially uh, question about our investments in pre-breeding R&D. And said, our investments in pre-breeding R&D, are they going to increase rates of genetic gain? And we have to ask that question. Um, and that can come through better enhanced genetic variants, and so Y crosses, germplasm access, novel sources of germplasm. Population size, numbers, throughput, how can we, there's a whole heap of ways you can increase uh, population size. In essence, population size, and those will know that yeah, people like Reg and David will know 
that that basically population side is a constraint usually by resources. It's a balance of getting the po right population size. You've never always got the right population size. You compromise usually because of access to resources. So there's technology you can use to, to do that even with fixed resources. New statistical methods, technologies, better better phenotyping technologies as well to improve your heritability, improve your accuracy of selection and your gener generation time, the time it takes to go from when you uh, make a cross to the time that you identify a parent that should be recycled in your breeding program, that gen generation cycling time is your critical driver of rates of genetic gain and there's some things you can do about that including uh, various genomic selection technologies. So that's the, a very simplified version of where the, how uh, the pre-breeding area will be re realigned. It'll look like this. So genetic variation, I don't need to go all over, I've, I've talked about all of that. So what also will happen, if you remember, the, the genetic technologies group within GRDC was structured around traits. In future, it will be structured around uh, crops. So we'll have a person who will be a person and one uh, junior manager be responsible for wheat, a person responsible for barley and coarse grains, and a person responsible for oil seeds and pulses as a minimum, as a starting point. Uh, all focused on genetic variation, population size, breeding accuracy and generation time and all the relating technologies to that. Right, so the enabling platforms group will essentially be made up of uh, this group here that we've just talked about plus this one here, bioinformatics, modelling, digital agriculture, big data. So we've got very minimal capacity in this, this place from, a, from an R&D management point of view at this, this time and we see this is where there's likely to be significant growth. We're recruiting a person up here, the executive manager right now, to be, take this role and to lead uh, the development of all of these groups uh, but particularly this one here. You'll notice MVT in here, and we've clustered that MVT is really the odd one out here, and that's because of the link. You know, even breeding and even breeding uh, pre-breeding area is all about data generation now. It's about phenotyping and data generation. This is about data generation and management. This is about data generation and management. We want to bring it all together to capture opportunities out of out of uh, this, which we think are huge in potential. Okay, we covered that. Just briefly, uh, I'm not going to go into this at all, but uh, we've invested in the order of $4 million so far with a further $1 million a year for the next two or three years in a full integrated um, um, project and financial management system, which those of you that went to the to the training forum that the GRDC people put on uh, would have seen that your interface through that will be through, in future, will be through a portal. Uh, it's a work in progress, but it's extremely powerful. It's a <laughs> understatement, is that right, Mike? <laughs> it's a work in progress. It is a work in progress. Um, however, it's extremely powerful. Um, we had a guy a logistics guy from the Australian Army came in and looked at it and he said, this is very, you know, like he's done a hell of a lot of work in all sorts of logistics stuff. And he said, this is really impressive. It's just early days about what we can do with it. Um, historically, if we, if somebody put up a new idea, um, uh, stay green in sorghum, you would have to go through files this high to try and find out whatever had been done in Stay Green and Sorbonne for the, for the last 10, 20 years. Now you can just hit a button, bang, it all comes up and you can search it and you can see who's done what, where and how. Um, that's just one of the small parts. But the integrated financial management of it cuts out a lot of that bureaucracy and that slow responsiveness. Uh, it's um, yeah, a pretty powerful system. 
moving to a continuous investment cycle. I won't go into the, the, uh, the story uh, about this in terms of having a, you know, people, people got used to the idea of we'd have an investment plan once a year where you put all the new innovation, new ideas in at one, once a year. I say to people, particularly growers, I say, how often do you just sit down for a week and put all your ideas down and never have an idea for the rest of the year? Um, never. <laughs> no one does that. Um, but there's a whole heap of other reasons uh, to do with our structure in terms of our financial uh, um, obligations to the federal government and our ability to be able to essentially manage finance department controlled deficits. Essentially, we manage to a deficit, a, a pre-approved deficit, three years out. We have to make our revenue has to be forecasted six months before the crop is planted. And then we have to meet a deficit budget on the basis of a forecast revenue six months before the crop is planted. So um, anyway, I could go on for hours about that one. <laughs> I think that's why sugar went to an IOC, wasn't it? <laughs> yep. Right, finally, the five-year strategic R&D plan. We will, this has just started. Uh, we had a board meeting session on it about a, two weeks ago followed by a session with panels and senior staff uh, last week. And we're about to start a consultation phase that'll include you, the opportunity to put in there. But here's the take home messages and key points of what this will look like and where, uh, give you a feel for where we think it will be heading. There is absolutely no doubt it will be about profitability. In fact, it'll be structured around price, yield and cost and incremental and transformational investments in those three areas across the whole portfolio in addition to strategies for each crop, each of the 25 crops as well, aligned in the same way under, under yield, price, cost. It's all about profit drivers so the, the whole system and will be about focusing about profit. There is, we will be shifting our emphasis on transformational impact. So that we'll be looking for opportunities for key significant investments that we, we, you, all of us, believe can make a transformational impact. The time frame is not that as important, but it is about making high impact. The growers, I, when I've gone out and been consulted with growers, and particularly the, the top end of town, they are all saying, you're not stretching us enough, you're not stretching us enough. You're pushing from the bottom, not pulling from the top. And I think that's right. We need to reassess that. I think it positions um, the universities quite well here. It also, the profit driver and the spectrum of it, remember we're talking about profit is from one end to the other. It, uh, when you've got an organisation that has various components of R&D that can come together, you're well positioned to be able to position yourself uh, as a key R&D partner going forward. I think this is, without being too preemptive about what's going on, what, what will happen, there is no doubt the opportunities here are for, um, for really for growing a, a, a profitability in, in Australian grain growers, we're going to have to focus more and more and more on high value opportunities, on high value capture opportunities. That doesn't mean we don't work on the other space, but we need to capture higher value opportunities. And that will tend to, so we'll see a shift, at least a, 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 a little bit of a shift towards more investment in the, in the higher value crops and or higher value products. We'll definitely be looking for broader partnerships, particularly with the private sector. And the attractive things will be three-way partnerships, an investor in the form of GRDC, a research partner in the form of a university, let's say, and a corporate entity who's going to help drive that 
R&D investment, put input into it, IP into it, and help with a delivery pathway as well. Will be where the organisation's been talking about this sort of attitude or this sort of approach for a while, um, but it hasn't been able to make it happen. Um, we are ready to make it happen. I guess as part of that is that where we see the opportunities going forward are not, there, there's still plenty of opportunities, still plenty of low hanging fruit in the traditional areas of R&D, in grains R&D, but the partnerships that we're sort of excited with and we'll be stretching ourselves, we'll be out engaging with and trying to capture new ideas from are, the, are from also from the more non-traditional areas in engineering and IT and communications, food and beverage, trade, logistics, marketing, the like. I, t I use an example. I say uh, an RD&E investment, for example, that advises policy that affects market access, for example, that ultimately delivers profitability is a damn good investment if that's a bigger profit kick than, uh, I don't know, some 1% yield gain. GRDC has taken, over the last 26 years, it's taken roles where from time to time it's played a key role in strategy and, and uh, organisation and drive and leadership in the grains industry. And other times it's basically abdicated total responsibility for it. Um, we believe that we need to get back in, we need to help facilitate good outcomes. Okay, we're about rd and &E, but we are well placed to be able to influence good strategy across the grains industry. And we're seeing some really promising things even happening right here and now, even with a meeting I was at yesterday, which was breakthrough in terms of getting, potentially getting very disparate, disparate competitive factions within the grains industry working together shouldn't say too much because I'll jinx it. Okay, last slide. Um, so I put this slide up at the Australian Grains Industry Conference in the second week of, third week of July. I'd been in the job for, for uh, two and a half, three weeks. Um, and I said, this is what I wanted GRDC to be. And I think I used the example of, of uh, Microsoft with their I think it's two billion dollar investment in their R&D arm per year in California, and how valued that is, and how core it is to to driving Microsoft. Or oh, that was Apple, sorry, not Microsoft. Apple. Um, we want to be appreciated the same way. Want to be valued by growers the same way. We want to be open and transparent and trusted. A true research partner, not a funder, a partner. And. We want to be agile and business-like. And I, I said that then, and I don't think there's too much to that that we uh, would want to change. So I hope that's given you some insights into what we're changing in GRDC or what we're trying to change in it. Uh, I do um, urge you to be patient. <laughs> uh, I've been here for 11 months, and driving the sort of change that's been here has, I would have hoped to achieve in five or six. Um, but it has taken 11, so we are really only just got started. So be patient with us. Uh, we are trying and we, we really, now that you understand where we're trying to head, I would very much welcome your insights into how we can do things even better.